Hello everyone. I am Manan and I am a PhD student in the labs of Dr. Florian Yuk and Dr. Pavel Tumanchik at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. Today I will present my group's work on instant segmentation in microscopy. So the task of instant segmentation is to identify a region that corresponds to a certain class. Here for example we are interested in the region that is expressing the membrane marker and then to partition this region such that all individual objects are assigned a unique label or ID. There are many downstream benefits of doing instant segmentation. Say for example if you have a volume instant segmentation then you can convert it to a surface mesh and then extract properties such as curvature at any point, areas of overlap between faces, fit dynamic models and so on. If you have instant segmentations calculated at two different time points from a time lapse series then by associating the morphologies one can assign them the same ID and thus in turn address the problem of lineage tracing. Often we acquire images with multiple channels where the first channel carries some information of interest and the second channel has some secondary structures such as cells and nuclei on which we can perform instant segmentation. Then by using feature based registration approaches on this second channel we can obtain the optimal transform between these two pair of, pair of images and thus in turn align gene expression maps and the list goes on. So, in the last decade, there have been many deep learning based uh, methods for instant segmentation and two uh, recently published methods that have been widely adopted by the community are here. Let's look at some of the features. So in Stardust, the authors chose an auxiliary form to represent the ground truth instance masks that are available during the training process. And this auxiliary form is essentially a star convex representation where for each pixel we calculate the distance to the object boundary along a set of rays. So these radial rays are equispaced in 2D and defined as the rays of a Fibonacci lattice in 3D. In cell post the authors went for a different auxiliary representation. Here they simulate a heat diffusion equation by placing a heat source at the center of each object. What this gives is a temperature field. Now if we look at the gradients in X and Y, then uh, we obtain two target maps that the differentiable function should map each input image to during the training process. So one key thing to note is both these methods use auxiliary representations of the ground truth instance masks to update the model weights. And a corollary to that is that both methods do not optimize for the intersection over union metric by using the ground truth instance masks. And this is important because the IOU is often the readout that we are most interested in from the instant segmentation approaches. Now let me switch gears and talk about another family of approaches called as embedding based approaches which have shown great results in the natural image domain. Here the intuition is, could we predict a tag or an embedding for each pixel such that pixels that belong to any one object are closer to each other in this embedding space and are further away from each other further away from the pixels belonging to other objects. And there are, there's a rich body of literature in this domain, but two works that have been widely adopted by the community are Turb Rabandir and Nevin in 2017 and Nevin in 2019. The 2017 work poses this question, could we learn a differentiable function that maps any input pixel carrying low level features such as pixel intensity to a pixel embedding, which is a higher, higher dimension feature that might have that might carry context such as neighborhood description, intensity gradients, and so on. They enable this by two forces: an intracluster pull force that pulls the pixel embeddings to the mean embedding location shown as a plus, and an intercluster pu push force that pushes these clusters away from each other. So these forces are hinged, which means that they are only active until a certain length scale which are defined to be constants in the results by these authors. And this method also does not directly optimize for the IOU. In Nevin et al, uh, several improvements were made to the 2017 work. One key difference is that they used a two-dimensional pixel embedding, which renders it to be in the same space as the pixel locations and an effective spatial embedding. Additionally, instead of using fixed length scales for these forces, they actually learn a margin bandwidth for each pixel. They also learn a CDMA score for each pixel, which we'll talk about in the coming slides. And most important, they optimize for the IOU metric during the training process. 
So how do they do it? During training, the goal is to load a differentiable function that maps any input image to five target maps. And these maps are the offset of each pixel to the object center along x and y, the margin bandwidth along x and y, and a CDNS score. Now, uh, we'll understand all these components one by one as we go over the loss computation. During this process, they loop over each object. So here, all the other objects are masked out, and only one of the objects is shown, and the corresponding predictions are shown. First, they concatenate the offsets with the pixel locations to obtain the spatial embeddings. Here the spatial embeddings are E, the pixel locations are X, and the offsets are O. So say for example, if these white dots are the pixel locations sampled from this object, then by concatenating the offsets, we end up with these pink spatial embeddings. Next, by averaging the bandwidths coming from the pixels belonging to this object, they obtain the main instance bandwidth along X and Y. Then they compute a Gaussian function, phi. This Gaussian function essentially says how close is my pixel embedding to the object center. And if the, pix if the margin bandwidths uh, for the defined for the instance are not the same, then uh, it takes this form where it becomes a function of the margin bandwidths along x and y. And the, what the authors try to implement is that if for any pixel the, its spatial embedding leads to a phi greater than 0 0.5, then that pixel is assigned to the instance. So now if we backtrack and we say which pixels led to a spatial embedding which led to a 5 greater than 0 0.5, then we can come to a predicted instance mask which we can compare with a ground truth instance mask to obtain the IOU during the training. And this can be plugged into a loss function to, to update the model weights in such a way that they lead to a sensible offset and a margin bandwidth for each pixel. Com like adding the IOU directly to a loss function is not uh, suitable because it, it's not differentiable. So instead, they use the Lovash softmax loss to uh, to make the process completely differentiable. And the key component of the loss computation is the CDNS. So for each pixel, a CDNS score is computed, which basically says how close is my pixel embedding to this to the object center. And the loss function that's defined to uh, predict this sensibly essentially regresses the CDNS score for each pixel to its uh, the Gaussian score coming from that pixel. For the background pixels, the CDNS score is regressed to zero. Uh, if you look at the process of training, then uh, here we show different objects and we sample uh, five pixels randomly uh, and they're shown as pluses. And also additionally, we show their pixel embeddings, which are shown as dots and the margin bandwidth, which is shown as a transparent ellipse. During the process of inference, we hope that uh, the trained model shown in green is able to generalize for an unseen image and produce five sensible target maps. These maps are processed uh, in a greedy manner. First, a list of pixels is kept uh, where these are those pixels that have a CDNS above a certain threshold, which in this case is 0 0.9. Then uh, processing it from, uh, from, from the top, uh, we look at, for example, the green pixel and we ask where its spatial embedding is, and that would be close to the object center because that was a task during the training. And then uh, we query which are the pixels coming from the foreground that embed within this margin bandwidth with a confidence more than 0 0.5. And if we backtrack and identify those pixels, then we would get a predicted instance mask for this object. A lot of the pixels in this list, which could be potential seeds, might also embed at this location. And if they do, then they're removed from the list. And since we're pro proceeding in a greedy manner, then we move on to the next available uh, highest rated seed pixel until there is no more seed pixel left. So uh, when we tried applying this strategy to biomedical data, we noticed that in certain scenarios, uh, it might not be the optimal solution. Uh, an example is given here. Say if, if this was a highest rated seed pixel, then if we apply the same strategy that we just discussed and we ask where spatial embedding is, it might be close to object center. So the object center was defined as a centroid by Nevin et al. And uh, now if we query which pixels from the foreground would embed at this location, then we know that pixels from this blue object and pixels from this green object both would embed at this location, which would give rise to a merged instance, which is not desirable. So instead we propose using the midoid as a, a ground truth center definition because 
the midoid has a desirable property of being one point amongst a set of points belonging to that object. And the midoid is defined actually as the point that has the least average distance to all other points. So with this, uh, there is higher chance of better demarcation between these two objects. Additionally, we implemented we integrated test time augmentation uh, to Nevin et al. So the this is a st standard strategy, and the intuition is that if that if we have an unseen image and we feed it to a trained model, then it leads to some predictions. And if we were to transform it, say through rotation and feed it again, then it would lead to another set of predictions. But surprisingly, the inverse transform applied to these predictions does not equal to the predictions coming from the original image. And this is because of the lack of rotational covariance coming from convolutional neural networks. So a common strategy is to feed in multiply transformed versions of the evaluation image into the trained network, get multiple predictions, back transform these predictions and average them uh, per pixel. And uh, this leads to a better, uh, this leads to better results. We show results of several baselines of Nevin et al and Nevin et al with our two modifications which we call as embed sig on three different data sets. Uh, we report results on the average precision calculated at different IOU thresholds. Here average precision is essentially a function of true positives, false positives and false negatives and a higher score is desirable. And as you can see we perform quite competitively compared to the other baseline methods. Here are some exemplary images uh, coming from these three data sets. Additionally we extended the method to 3D and we also introduced a new 3D neural architecture. We also introduce four new 3D datasets with ground truth annotations and we report results of embedsec 3D and two other 3D baseline methods on these four 3D datasets. These are some exemplary images coming from these four 3D datasets. And as you can see, we also perform competitively compared to the baseline methods. If we were to look at some qualitative results, then uh, here we see the x, y, y, z and z, x slices of the raw image, the ground truth image and the embedsec predictions. Sometimes the ground truth annotations has some mistake. For example, here one slice was not annotated, but embedded predictions are quite robust and they provide a good representation of the underlying shape. We also did some ablation studies where we showed that by removing both the modifications that we suggest, we lead to a drop in performance for three different data sets. So to summarize, our contributions include translating spatial embedding approaches to biomedical data, to extend the architecture and method to 3D so that it can be applied on volume images, to show that uh, midoid and test time augmentation both uh, makes inference more robust and boosts results. We introduced four new 3D datasets with annotations. All code and example notebooks are made available at this URL. Additionally, we try to make uh, the code GPU friendly by using virtual batching. Uh, this means that uh, people can now train it on their own standard laptops. Here we show uh, our attempts at integrating embedsec with uh, Napari GUI to make it more user friendly. This is a work in progress. With this, I would like to thank my lab for the continual support to the conference organizers for giving me an opportunity to present and to you for listening. Thank you so much.